welcome to NTD China News. I'm Karen Chang. Making headlines this Tuesday, March 26. Xi Jinping arrives in Africa in time for the BRICS summit. Is Russia selling its superjet to China? And Vietnam says a Chinese vessel fired at a Vietnamese fishing boat in disputed waters. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has arrived in South Africa in time for the meeting of five nations collectively known as BRICS. The heads of state are there to discuss the world economy and how to help developing nations get a leg up. Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping is in Durban, South Africa today for the fifth annual meeting of the so-called BRICS countries. The acronym stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. The BRICS countries came together after the 2008 financial crisis as an alternative to the Western and mostly U.S.-dominated financial institutions. They want more equal institutions that will give better aid to developing economies and meet the demands of the 21st century. On the agenda this week is the startup of a BRICS development bank. The respective countries' finance ministers met today and confirmed that the bank was definitely going forward. Together, the BRICS countries make up 40 percent of the world's people and roughly 25 percent of global GDP. The group varies widely in terms of economies, political systems and geographic location. South Africa joined the group in 2010 and this summit has placed an emphasis on the development of the African continent. Other African leaders are attending the summit as well as the head of the African Union. The BRICS summits will last for two days. With the development bank going ahead, the question now is how each country will contribute to the funding of the bank, which has set a capital goal of 50 billion. There's confirmation the Chinese military will get their hands on a Russian-made superjet. On Monday, Chinese state-run CCTV reported that China will be getting 24 Sukhoi Su-35s. It's Russia's most advanced superjet. The Chinese military will also get four Russian submarines. That adds to a fleet of 65 pre-existing ones. Some were built in China and have nuclear and ballistic missile capability. The Chinese regime has pursued the Su-35 since the 1990s, but Russia has been less than forthcoming with advanced military technology. They fear the Chinese military will reverse engineer Russian technology, creating a potential competitor in arms exports. Russian authorities, however, say they are confident the engine of the Su-35 cannot be copied. According to CCTV, the deal was apparently signed before Xi Jinping visited Russia over the weekend. Emboldened by the success of February's nuclear test, North Korea has been issuing increasingly volatile rhetoric, particularly threats of destruction to the United States. And now more concrete steps have been taken that could pose a real threat to U.S. military bases. A successful nuclear test in February and threats of direct attacks on the United States has many taking a second look at how serious a threat North Korea may be. Pyongyang has just ordered rocket and long-range artillery forces to prepare for a strike on U.S. military bases in Guam, Hawaii, and even the mainland of the United States. While it is dubious that North Korean missiles could actually reach the heart of the U.S., the Pentagon is taking the threat seriously enough to begin a renewed focus on the missile defense program. The Pentagon admitted in a press briefing on March 15th that North Korea has become a threat, quote, a little bit faster than we expected. After North Korea's announcement today, China's foreign ministry spokesman Hong Lei called for calm on both sides. China is largely seen as the only country that could have any sway over North Korea. And although the Chinese regime has, on the surface, supported UN Security Council sanctions against the North, many question how seriously it has been enforcing them. Despite threats by North Korea to turn the U.S. into a, quote, sea of fire, South Korea and Japan would be more concerned. Both countries are well within known North Korean missile range. The latest provocation from North Korea came after South Korea and the U.S. signed a new plan last Friday to defend a possible attack on the South. Last year, the Chinese regime decided to include a large part of the South China Sea as part of its territory, despite sovereignty disputes with several nations. It says fishing trawlers from other countries are not allowed to be there, and this has led to a row with Vietnam. After a period of relative calm on the South China Sea, Vietnam has accused a Chinese vessel of firing a flare at a Vietnamese fishing boat. It happened last Wednesday near the Parasol Islands. It's an area of the South China Sea that's under dispute between China and several other Southeast Asian countries, including Vietnam. Last year, the Chinese regime incorporated the islands in large parts of the South China Sea under its administrative rule. 
It says the presence of fishing boats from other countries is illegal. The Vietnamese government said on Monday that an unidentified Chinese vessel chased the fishing boat and fired a flare that burnt down the cabin. A complaint has been lodged with the Chinese embassy in Hanoi. The Chinese regime today admitted a patrol boat took action against the Vietnamese fishing trawler, but denied damaging the boat. Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei told Vietnam to tell its fishermen to stay away from the waters. Vietnam says China violated maritime law and wants those involved to be investigated. The disputed area is rich in natural gas. China, Vietnam, as well as countries including the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia and Brunei all lay claims to the waters. And coming up after the break, free trade talks between China, Japan and South Korea. Why girls in China are doing better in school than boys and two ferry diplomats from China arrive in Canada. Three of Asia's top four economies are meeting to discuss a free trade alliance today. China, Japan and South Korea have been trying to work out a free trade agreement, but the efforts have been stalled over fears of cheap Chinese goods flooding the other countries. China, Japan and South Korea are holding free trade talks in Seoul today, aimed at opening the door for future discussions. It comes after years of trying but never successfully implementing a free trade agreement between the three economies. Bilateral talks between China and South Korea have been active, but talks with Japan have stalled since 2004. Japan is worried its farmers could be hit with an influx of cheap food as China's subsidies and undervalued currency create distorted prices. Outside the meeting, South Korean protesters voice similar fears. FTA among China, Japan and South Korea will collapse and annihilate our agriculture and it will add more worries about the food crisis to our people. So we urge them to stop the FTA talks. Analysts say that the renewed talks are an initiative from Beijing to counter a growing U.S. interest in the region and to smooth out relations. China and Japan have been in a headlock over resource-rich islands in the East China Sea. South Korea's Deputy Minister of Trade said at the meeting that this would be a good chance to put aside political differences and work for mutual prosperity. The three countries are all in the top four Asian economies. Together they make up 20 percent of global GDP. A controversial sale of Hong Kong's next media in Taiwan has fallen through. The planned deal was worth almost $600 million. Next Media's owner Jimmy Lai had been in talks with a group of Taiwanese businessmen to sell his media on the island. They include the Taiwan Apple Daily and Next TV. Many of Lai's media outlets are known to be critical of China, but the main buyer in the deal would have been the Want Want China Times Group. Its owners have come under scrutiny for being close to the Chinese regime. The owner of the China Times Group, Tai Eng Meng, pulled out of the deal before it was set to close tomorrow. After acquiring China Network Systems last July, he was worried that the anti-monopoly laws could interfere. The proposed next media sale had drawn loud criticisms in Taiwan, with many fearing those media would become less robust with reporting on China-related issues. For now, next media plans to continue operating its papers and magazines and is looking for another shareholder to take Tsai's place. China's controversial one-child policy has drawn outrage again and is over another late-term abortion. Despite earlier speculations some of the brutal enforcements of the population control measures would relax, the latest case indicates otherwise. Another late-term forced abortion has been reported in China. It happened over the weekend in Anhui province. The husband of the pregnant woman said local family planning officials received a tip about their unplanned pregnancy and injected her with abortion-inducing chemicals. After she became pregnant unexpectedly, someone reported us and authorities came to arrest us. The baby died on Sunday after they injected my wife on Friday. China. Monetary rewards are often given for reporting a family that is having a second child. The 33-year-old woman, surnamed Blue, is still in the hospital. Her husband said they haven't told her that the aborted fetus was a boy. I think that if we went over the birth quota, authorities should deal with us, the adults. The child is innocent, and now they've ended its life. A graphic image of the aborted fetus has been passed around on Chinese internet. The Chinese regime's controversial one-child policy has faced increasing opposition from inside China. Late-term abortions are meant to be illegal under the policy, but reports of them happening still surface. During the two sessions this month, 
The Family Planning Committee was merged with the Health Ministry, with speculations that the population control measures would be loosened, though the latest case indicates it's business as usual for the enforcement officials. The Health Ministry published data this month. Between 1971 and 2010, 336 million abortions have taken place under the one-child policy. That's more than 23,000 abortions each day. In Chinese grade schools, girls are by and large outperforming boys. Between 2006 and 2007, 65% of the national scholarships in China went to girls. And in 2010, over 300,000 more girls enrolled in Chinese universities than boys. China's education system is one based on obedience and memorization of facts, which some believe girls are better at than boys. Boys are also perceived as being more spoiled at home, perhaps encouraging girls to work harder to get into better universities to have better careers. But their success hasn't translated to the top level. Only a few top-ranking members of the Chinese Communist Party are women, and there are significantly fewer women business leaders. The gender performance gap at school is also seen elsewhere. In Britain, there are one-third more university applications from females. In the US, 55% of high school students are females. Two new Chinese diplomats arrived in Toronto on Monday. They've been described as cute and cuddly, quite different from the image of China's communist regime. Next, we meet the pair of Chinese ambassadors that will spend 10 years in two Canadian zoos. In the latest act of panda diplomacy, a pair of giant pandas arrived in Toronto on Monday. Female Ershun and male Da Mao are on a 10-year loan from China to the Toronto and Calgary zoos. Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper was on site to welcome the animals along with dozens of media. Well, that was quite a moment. It's not every day in your life you get the sign for pandas. The Prime Minister said the pandas will help the two countries learn more about one another and serve as a reminder of their deepening relationship. According to the Asia-Pacific Foundation of Canada's President Yuan Pao Wu, the pandas could help Canadians learn about aspects of China that are, quote, perhaps not quite as cuddly. Wu hopes Canadians will use this opportunity to reflect on their country's growing relationship with China. University of Alberta China Institute Director Gordon Holden said Canada will always have certain concerns about China, such as human rights issues. Holden said panda diplomacy is a way for the Chinese regime to attempt to change and enhance its image. The pandas will spend five years at the Toronto Zoo and five more at the Calgary Zoo. Officials hope the couple will mate during their 10-year visit and produce the first panda cubs to be born in Canada. All cubs born to the pandas will remain the property of China, helping the country keep a monopoly over the world's supply of giant pandas. The 10-year agreement for Ershun and Da Mao will cost Canada $1 million annually. The panda exhibit at the Toronto Zoo is scheduled to open in May. And that's all for this broadcast of NTD China News. For more about China-related topics, visit our website at ntd.tv or subscribe to our YouTube channel, NTD on China. Coming up next is China Focus, where I speak with Jason Ma and Chen Zhifei about the relationship of China and Russia. Stay tuned.